Calling case number 16-MD-2741, In Re Roundup Products Liability Litigation. Counsel, please state your appearances for the record. Amy Wagstaff for the plaintiffs, and with me is Jennifer Moore, Catherine Forge, Brian Brake, Rudy Swallow, and Tesfaya Testic. Morning. Good morning, Honor. Brian Steckloff on behalf of Monsanto. Along with me is Tamara Matthews Johnson, Rakesh Kalaru, and Mike Ambrosio. Morning. Um, before we get started, I thought I might um, begin to provide you all with a little bit of guidance about Wednesday, um, because there are so many issues, and I know there's so much for you to prepare for. I thought it would be helpful to pare it down a little bit if I could. So, um, first of all, before I forget, Dr. Arbor's expert report, we think it is not in the record. Um, so, if you, if you all could just get us just file Dr. Arbor's expert report. Um, uh, on, uh, so in terms of what we will and won't talk about on Wednesday, on, the, on Monsanto's summary judgment motion relating to issues other than the experts, um, the only issue I want to hear argument about is, is, is the statute of limitations issue for Mr. Gabayu. Uh, I won't, I don't need to hear argument on any of those other issues. Um, so uh, to the extent you've already begun preparing for that, I apologize. Um, with respect to the experts, um, I will want to hear argument on um, the motion to exclude all or portions of Monsanto's specific causation experts. And I'll give you, I'll, I'll probably put out some guidance or, or a tentative ruling or something like that um, before Wednesday um, on that issue. Um, I will also want to hear argument on the motions to exclude the plaintiff's specific causation experts. Um, and then I think I think that leaves, well, that, so that leaves the motions in limine, which I haven't begun going through yet, so I'm not sure. We'll, I, I, I may put something out before Wednesday telling you what I want to hear argument about and what I don't um, on the motions in limine. And then that leaves, um, I think the only other issue we would potentially discuss on Wednesday is the motion to exclude experts that are offering opinions on something other than specific causation and on on that I'm not sure I'm I'm actually I, I'm not sure yet whether I I want to hear argument on any of those I may and again I'll, pro I'll probably put something out on that to give you some guidance before Wednesday um, is there anything I'm forgetting that we would potentially be discussing on Wednesday I don't believe so in terms of pending motions, Your Honor. Your Honor, I think the only other item on the agenda would be jury instructions if we want to talk about the jury instruction for phase one. Yes, and at least <clears throat> we probably ought to nail down the causation instructions or instruction at least um, for phase one. I mean, I assume, I assume for phase one it'll just be the, the standard introductory instructions that I always give um, and uh, causation is, is really all we need to nail down at the uh, at the front end for phase one right I, I think the causation that will help us then with the verdict form too verdict form yeah yeah so we'll talk about that on Wednesday as well okay great okay. thank you your honor sounds good so with that um, are we uh, are we ready to go with our final Daubert hearing all right. Is Dr. Weisenberger here? Yeah, we'll have Dr. Weisenberger. And we're going to begin with the cross examination based on your right. honor's prior. Hello again. Good morning. 
Dennis Weisenberger, uh, D-E-N-N-I-S, W-E-I-S-E-N-B-U-R-G-E-R. -E -E May we proceed, Your Honor? Sure. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Weisenberger. Good morning. You are here this morning to offer opinions on specific causation as relates to three plaintiffs, Mr. Hardiman, Mr. Gabayu, and Ms. Stevix. Is that correct? Yes. That's Stevic without an S, sorry. I'd like to move into the record your expert reports on specific causation for each of those. So just for the record, for Hardiman, it's Exhibit 2100. For Mr. Gabayu, it's 2101. And for Ms. Stevic, it's 2102. Objection. Admitted. And you have those in front of you, don't you, sir? You just have a couple of binders with materials. If you need to refer to them, those expert reports are there in front of you, sir. Okay, Correct. thank you. Uh, in the c course of, of putting together these reports, you reviewed medical records for each of the plaintiffs. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And you spoke with each of them by telephone approximately 45 minutes to an hour. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And you did not conduct a physical examination of any of the plaintiffs? I did not. And in the course of speaking with them for that 45 minute to an hour period, you were looking to determine the minimum amount of Roundup exposure they had? I was looking to de determine overall what kind of Roundup exposure they had. Um, I was looking to clarify some points from the medical record and to go through um, the differential diagnosis of, uh, with regard to specific causation. And with regard to exposure, you were using as a benchmark particular epidemiology, and you were looking to see, fair to say, that the minimum exposure would be at least two times per year, and at least a total of ten times, so that you would be able to determine that the plaintiff's round of exposure was a substantial contributing factor to his or her development of NHL. Is that right? Well, um, I used those sort of as a baseline or a guideline, but uh, I didn't use them as sort of, sort of an absolute uh, floor or number to decide whether any of them had um, a high exposure or not. So uh, I use them as a guideline. Well, the guideline, sir, then provided the threshold that if they surpassed that threshold, you determined that Roundup exposure was a significant contributing factor. Is that right? Not necessarily. So, for example, um, let's take Mr. Hardiman, as an ex just as an example, if he had only been exposed uh, greater than two days in two years, that would have been only four exposures. I wouldn't have considered that a high exposure, okay? So one has to look really at each of the um, cases and determine uh, on the basis of what they tell you what their exposure really was. And uh, the exposure for all three of these uh, cases was much, much higher than those uh, uh, floor limits, if you will, uh, uh, from the epidemiology studies. So, right. Well, let me. Well, I, it wasn't an automatic decision. It wasn't. Uh, if it's above this, it's, it's they're in. If it's not above this, they're out. So I looked at all the parameters related to exposure. Well, in your answer, sir, you just gave a. I don't like to do math on the fly, but you did say two days per year for four years for a total of eight days, which would be below the Erickson 2008 threshold of 10 lifetime days, right? That's what you just said in your answer, eight lifetime days. I don't remember what I said. I, I meant to say two years, two, two days per year for two years, so that's four days. Four days, sorry. That's why I said I don't do math. But that is below the Erickson 10 days lifetime exposure, correct? It is, yes. Okay. So what I was asking about was a different bit of math, which is two days per year for at least five years for a total of 10 lifetime days. And my question was, if a plaintiff exceeded that threshold, would you then determine that Roundup exposure was a substantial contributing factor in his or her development of NHL? I don't know. I, 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 didn't, I didn't have to make that decision. I would say probably not because that isn't very much exposure. Well, in another deposition, sir, that you gave relating to a different plaintiff, a Ms. Adams, 
you were asked about, Adams is the lead plaintiff, excuse me, but in this case you were being asked about a Ms. Gordon, that's a different case, but that's a plaintiff where you've also offered an expert opinion, is that correct, about specific causation? Yes. Okay, and in that instance you were asked, if you took Ms. Gordon's circumstances and said everything was the same, except that she testified and told you on the phone that she had used glyphosate two times a year for five years, ten times total, would any of your opinions be different? You recall that? And your answer was no. The, the reason I said, sure. uh, hold on. I can hold lay, absolutely. I'm happy to lay more foundation. Yes. I was just going to say, if she's referring to a specific page and line number of the deposition, if she can refer that to the Absolutely. So if we can go to exhibit 2107. <laughs> And if you would please go to page 114, sir. Okay. So you're on what line? And line five. All right, so line five. We're getting at line five, page 114. Okay, I just want to take Ms. Gordon's circumstances and say everything is the same, except that she testified and told you on the phone that she had used glyphosate two times a year for five years, ten times total. Would any of your opinions be different? No you would have the same exact, I'm sorry, you would have the exact same opinions. Answer, yes. Do you recall that testimony, sir? I don't recall it, but uh, it, I see it now, yes. Okay, and with respect to Plaintiff Hardiman, Plaintiff Gabayu, Plaintiff Stevick, you were looking to see if they, each of them, had two days per year 10 total lifetime days or uses of Roundup. And based on that, sir, you ruled in Roundup as a substantial contributing factor to each plaintiff's development of NHL. Is that correct? Uh, that was a long, complicated question. Could you please repeat it? Sure, I'd be happy to. When you looked at the exposure, for each of the plaintiffs, Gabayu, Hardiman, and Stevick, if you saw that they had been exposed to Roundup for two days per year and a total of 10 lifetime days, you then, based on that, ruled in Roundup as a substantial contributing factor in each plaintiff's development of NHL. Is that correct? I did, but it was based on much higher exposure than those um, floor limits. You're saying, in fact, you thought they had more exposure, but I'm asking you about your methodology of ruling in Roundup. So what are you asking me? Based on the epidemiology, were you using two days per year, 10 lifetime days, as your basis for ruling in Roundup? I was using as a guideline. It wasn't a floor number or a hard number. I was using it as a, as a guideline. But that was your guideline for determining sufficient exposure, correct? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. As I told you, if, if, if uh, Mr. Hardiman had only been exposed twice a year for two years, he had only four exposures, I wouldn't, he would have met the criteria for one of those, but not the, and, but not the other. I wouldn't have ruled him in. So I, I these are Dr. These Weisenberg, if I could interrupt it, 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 it does seem like you're not answering her question. Um, I think her question is if Mr. Hardiman were um, exposed twice a year for five years, would you uh, rule, would you rule it in? 
That's the question. You keep going to twice a year for two years, and you say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, con I would say that's not enough, but she keeps asking you, <coughs> she, she, what she's trying to get at is, it seems like your methodology is that once somebody has been exposed twice a year for at least five years, um, that, uh, that you, you would conclude that NHL is uh, a substantial, excuse me, that glyphosate is a substantial contributing factor to their, their NHL. And so that's really the question you should be answering now, it, yes or no? The hypothetical, I would say, I would probably change my, 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 my testimony and say no, because I would have to look at all the rest of the exposure uh, that goes on. So, um, you know, 10 times over a lifetime is not very much exposure, and I probably would say no. And you I probably would recommend to the lawyers to settle on that case and not take it to trial because I don't think it would be a very strong case. And when you say 10 days, two days per year, you would say that that's not sufficient? Is that, are you, you did mention changing your testimony. So just going back, if we could just call up the previous testimony and then we're going to walk through a little bit more testimony. But if we can just go back to where we were just a moment ago, which was at Adams, where you were, page 114. Are you saying here that you are changing your testimony given under oath uh, in this case, just for the record, sorry, given on November 26, 2018 in the case of Adams v. Monsanto Company? Yeah, I'm changing my testimony. I'm, you know, I was taken through a whole litany of hypotheticals uh, that um, were not really very relevant to the case, and this is an example of that. Okay, let's go back one page in the same sworn testimony to see if there's any other testimony you'd like to change. And if we can go to page 113, line six, please. And we're gonna call it six through 21. Sorry, I should've. Okay, doctor, are you with me now? Now I'm on page 113, line six through 21. Are you, are you with me? Okay, and we, and I'm gonna, oh, we'll take it one step at a time. All right, the question is, okay, so is it, just to push a little bit on that, is it fair to say that you would, that your minimum exposure would be at least two times per year, and at least a total of 10 times, for you to be able to determine that the plaintiff's roundup exposure was a substantial contributing factor to his or her development of NHL? And we will do the whole answer. Well, those are the only things that I would know to really base my opinion on, so I'd say yes, that would be at least the minimum exposure to say that she has a relative risk of greater than two for diffuse large, spell B, large B cell lymphoma, and we go to the next, but obviously her exposure was much higher than that, but obviously, oh, excuse me, much greater than that, so her risk probably was higher than that, sorry. Okay, if you believe that there is a much that there is a dose response, her risk probably would have been much higher, but we don't have data on that. And then we go on to the testimony that you gave in response to the hypothetical. And so are you here saying now that your testimony on page 114 is the testimony that you would now like to change? Yes. Now, let's go to page 69 to see if you would if there's any testimony that you would like to change there, same deposition. Okay, we're looking at page 69 and we're gonna start at line eight, but you can call out that whole area. If we can call out. Absent any causative risk factors other than glyphosate, if a patient has, I'm starting with glyphosate intentionally, We're absent, not, are you? Oh, I apologize. We are on page, and you can also look on your screen, but I'm doing the same thing you're doing, crossing back and forth. But if you go to page 69, and if you start, it kind of starts in the middle of that line, sir, but if we look at line eight, absent any causative risk factors other than glyphosate. Are you with me, sir? Yes. Absent any causative risk factors other than glyphosate, if a patient has, starting with glyphosate intentionally, absent any causative risk factors other than glyphosate, 
if a patient has sufficient exposure to glyphosate, would you say that the cause of his or her cancer in every instance is the glyphosate? And your answer is, I would say it's more likely than not glyphosate. Question, and if I asked you the same question about Roundup, your answer would be the same. And your answer is yes. I would stand by that. And what you're saying now is that you're changing your testimony as to what a sufficient exposure to glyphosate is, sir? Overruled, you can answer it if you. So a, a sufficient exposure to glyphosate is a subjective decision based on my expertise and the medical record and what I'm told, okay? And there's no specific floor for that. And that's a con, oh sorry. The epidemiology uh, studies give you some parameters which um, to, to guide you, but in fact, the parameters are very, um, there, there are only a couple of fa uh, factors, greater than two days or greater than 10 days. So, so you have to weigh all the evidence in terms of exposure with, with in, in view of those. But you've testified that there's no data on the question of higher limits of exposure. Is that, was that your testimony? There isn't any data. That's right. So you, th that's all the data you have. That's all the data we have. And oh, but it doesn't mean that that's the floor that one would use to make an, a, a, a yes or no decision. And that's with you changing your testimony on the question of the hypothetical. Is yes, that correct? Yes, because all three of these people had markedly higher exposures than these artificial floors created by the epidemiology studies, okay? When you say artificial floors, those are the floors you're relying upon. Yeah, because it's, it's the only data we have that, that we can rely on. So if 100 plaintiffs are brought to you and they all use Roundup for at least two times per year for at least five years for a total of life, uh, 10 lifetime days and had no other causative risk factors, would you say Roundup was a substantial contributing factor in those cases? I, I most likely would say no. It's most, it's most likely not Roundup. So under your methodology, though, if there, is, if there are no other causative risk factors and there is glyphosate exposure in keeping with the epidemiology you've cited, is glyphosate more likely than not the cause, sir? Yes or no? If it was only 10 exposures uh, over, over a lifetime, I would say probably not. What if it were two days per year for five years for 10 lifetime days? I would say probably not. With respect to each of these plaintiffs, sir, have you testified for Mr. Hardiman in, in each of these cases? I just want to establish this for the record. If Mr. Hardiman, could he have been diagnosed with the same exact diffuse large B cell lymphoma without exposure to Roundup? Could he have been diagnosed with the same cancer? He could have, but it's unlikely. We can now go to exhibit 2103. And that is your testimony in the Hardiman deposition. And if we can go to page 93 of that testimony. Sorry, I, I, I missed the exhibit number. Me, sorry, Your Honor, it is exhibit 2103. What page? We can go. We're now looking at lines one through five on page 93, sir. We can call out lines one through five, please. Okay. Question, and you would agree that Mr. Hardiman could have been diagnosed with the exact same diffuse large B-cell lymphoma without exposure to Roundup, true? And you said it's possible. He could have. It could have been idiopathic. It could have been, it could have been some other cause that we don't know. Just a moment ago, you said it was unlikely, but now it, are you sticking by that testimony? No, it, well, it, <laughs> it's possible, but unlikely. With reference to Mr. Anything Gu is possible, right? Well, I'm asking, sir, these are all in the context of you appearing as an expert, not 
right, you were here offering expert testimony, and you were saying as an expert that it's possible. Is that correct? It's possible, but it's unlikely. What about Mr. Gabayu? Could Mr. Gabayu have been diagnosed with the same cancer without exposure to Roundup? Possible, but unlikely. Would you agree that Ms. Stevick could have developed the exact same tumor without any exposure to Roundup? Yes, it's possible, but very unlikely. Okay. We can go to Exhibit 2105, which is your testimony in the Stevick case. Go to page 102. And if we can look at lines 15 through 18, please. And the question asked there, this is in the Stevick deposition. Would you agree with me, though, that Ms. Stevick could have developed the exact same tumor without any exposure to Roundup? And your answer there, sir, was yes. Is that yes, not right? Yes, it's possible, but unlikely. In the record, sir, is your answer at line 18 yes, period? Yes, but I'm modifying it to say it's possible, but unlikely. So now let's talk about some other causative as you call them, causative risk factors, because you do talk in your uh, testimony about the difference between associations and what you consider to be causative risk factors. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So HIV, we'll start with HIV. It is a causative risk factor, correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, you've been asked this before. If you have a patient with active HIV and their tumor doesn't have any markers for that virus or infection, and that person also has sufficient Roundup exposure, you would say in that situation, more likely than not, that Roundup was a substantial contributing factor. Is that correct? Is this a hypothetical? It is, right? It is. Yes. So in that situation, I would say the most substantial contributing cause, if those were the only ones that are left, was, was the HIV, but I couldn't rule out that Roundup also contributed. In other words, you can have more than one contributing cause, okay? And in that hypothetical, that's your answer. You could have more than one contributing well, cause. Well, I'd have to know how much exposure the person had to Roundup, okay? Was it a substantial exposure, like, like Mr. Hardiman had, for example? Or was it 10 days in, in a lifetime? I'd have to know, I'd have to look carefully at the exposure, and I'd have to care look carefully at the degree of immunosuppression that he had with his HIV infection. Uh, to know what his risk of getting lymphoma was. So it's much more complicated than just a simple hypothetical. Now, what about a plaintiff with active hepatitis C infection? If you had someone who had an active hepatitis C infection and sufficient exposure to Roundup, would you then still say that Roundup was a substantially contributing factor to their NHL? It may well be a substantial contributing factor. Uh, there can be more than one substantial contributing factor in cases where you've got two substantial contributing factors. So now looking at hepatitis C, you agree, sir, that hepatitis C is a causative risk factor for NHL, correct? Yes. And IARC has also analyzed the hepatitis C infection and classified it as a group one carcinogen. Isn't that right? Yes. And with respect to Mr. Hardiman, he was most likely exposed and, and infected with HCV in the 1960s. Is that right? Most likely, yes. And then I think you yourself noted, sir, that in 1980, when Mr. Hardiman applied for insurance with Kaiser, he had elevated liver enzymes and was denied health insurance on that basis. Isn't that correct? Yes. And based on that, I think you noted, sir, that we know in 1980 that he had active hepatitis. Isn't that right? Most likely, yes. Most likely he had active hepatitis. It okay. Do you recall saying, quote, we know in 1980 that he had acti active hepatitis? Well, most likely he did. I mean, we don't, we don't know for sure what was causing the elevated liver enzymes. We don't know the whole story, but most likely that's what it was, yes. Okay, and let's go to exhibit 2103, which is your testimony in 
the Hardeman case. Go to page one, I'm sorry, 35, excuse me. And if we could just, and we're gonna start at the bottom, line 20, and then we'll keep rolling to the next page. So if you start at line 20, sir. We don't really know when he contracted hepatitis C. The most we know that when he applied for medical insurance at Kaiser in 1980, he had elevated liver enzymes and they wouldn't give him the insurance. We can go to the next page. And then we say, looking at lines one through six, at least we know in 1980 that he had active hepatitis. Before that, we don't know. So it's likely it was in the 60s. That's when his risky behavior occurred, but we don't really know. So there, sir, in that testimony, you were clear that we know in 1980 he had active hepatitis that most likely was contracted in the 1960s. Is that right, sir? Well, I would modify that a little. We know he had elevated liver enzymes. We don't really know that he had hepatitis. He wasn't told that he had hepatitis. So I'm making the assumption that it was the hepatitis that caused the elevated liver enzymes. There are other things that cause elevated liver enzymes. So it could have been something else, but based on the story, it was most likely hepatitis. So we know Mr. Hardiman had a chronic infection for hepatitis C for 25 to 40 years. Is that right, sir? Well, that's what we're assuming, okay? That's an assumption. If we can go to page 71 of your Hardiman testimony, sir. This is exhibit 2103. And we're going, we're starting at the very bottom of that, the very last line, and then we're going to the next page. So the bottom of 71, let me make sure you have time to get there, sir. Are you there with me? Yes. But we know Mr. Hardiman had a chronic infection for hepatitis C for 25 to 40 years, right? And your answer is right. It should have been most likely, okay, but it probably is right. And you agree that I, I mean, I don't, I don't try to hedge on every question that people ask me, thinking about what a lawyer will ask me the next, in a, in a month or two. I'm trying to give a straightforward answer. I'm trying to give the best answer I can. Uh, but, you know, I'm making some assumptions here which I don't know are true. You agree, sir, that the latency period for exposure to HCV and the development of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can range anywhere from 5 to 35 years? You agree with that, sir? Yes. Decades? Yes. And latency, sir, relates to the time it takes for cancer to develop, but is it also not an issue of when an existing cancer reaches a level at which it's detectable? Well, usually latency is from the time of first exposure to when the diagnosis is made. Okay. And can cancer exist and not exist at a level where it can be did not diagnosed? So there's the, there's an issue of detectability where cancer exists. Sure, there's a period of time before the diagnosis when the cancer exists, uh, when it is detectable, and then there's a period of time before that where it probably is not detectable. So there is a time before the diagnosis when it is not detectable, sure. And exists. And exists, yes. You can't rule out the fact that chronic HCV infection for 20 to 25 to 40 years could cause mutations in Mr. Hardiman. Is that correct? It, it, it could cause mutations in Mr. Hardiman during that period of time. Therefore, 25 to 40 years of chronic hepatitis C infection could have played a role in Mr. Hardiman's NHL. It's possible, but unlikely. Is it possible that the hepatitis C could very well have contributed, could very well have contributed to Mr. Hardiman's NHL? It's possible, but it's very unlikely. And we go to your testimony, Exhibit 2103 in the Hardiman deposition. We'll go to page 73. Three? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> 
If we can start, we'll do starting at line 11, doctor, on page 73. And you would agree that you cannot rule out the role that the 25 to 40 years of chronic hepatitis C infection played in his diffuse large B cell lymphoma? Your answer, it could have played a role. It could have played a role. You know, it's my position that the fact that he was treated, he was in sustained virologic remission for nine or 10 years could have markedly decreased the risk. But I can't be absolutely certain the hepatitis C didn't contribute to his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it very well could have. Is that your testimony, sir? Yes. And so your testimony, as of this day, that day, and, and today, is that it could have played a role, but yet in your report, you ruled out hepatitis C. Is that right? I did rule it out because I don't think it would meet the standard of a substantial contributing cause, okay? And we can talk about why that is if you'd like, but um, I don't think it, it was a substantial contributing cause. And um, it could have played a role, but it's highly unlikely that it played a substantial role. When you were asked here under oath, you cannot rule out the role you answered it could have played a role. Was that your testimony, sir? Yes. Now, I, you may be aware of this, but there was an article that came up last week, sir, in testimony involving another witness. And that was exhibit 2052, which is in your binder. Same binder? <laughs> um, I'm not totally sure if it's in the same binder. <coughs> and it's in a different binder, but it's two, it's exhibit 2052. The title of this article is From Hepatitis C Virus Infection to B Cell Lymphoma. The lead author is L. Coronet. Okay. With me. Mm -hmm. And so looking at the introduction, sir, it says persistent, I'm sorry, if we could call it the, I think it's already, I think exhibit two zero, it has not been admitted. Okay, we would like to admit that. Thank you, Your Honor. Objection. Admitted. We could look at the introduction. Persistent hepatitis C, I'm going to read the first sentence. That persistent hepatitis C virus infection is an etiological agent of chronic hepatitis that may evolve towards cirrhosis and hepatocarcinoma. And then, if you look at, you skip that next sentence, you say this review aims to summarize evidence from epidemiological and clinical studies that have provided strong support for an eti etiological role of HCV in NHL development and maintenance. And if we go to page 95 of this article, there's a section about DNA damages induction. It's the second, yes, second column towards the bottom. So if you look at the right column, yeah, that's where we want to go. Thank you. DNA damages induction. By, acting, by activating error-prone polymerases and aid, HCV is able to cause mutations in immunoglobulin heavy chain, BCL6, TP53, and beta catenin genes of in vitro HCV infected B cell lines and HCV associated peripheral blood mononuclear cells, lymphomas, and hepatocellular carcinomas. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay. And if we go to the figure that's at the top of this page, there's a lot happening here, but figure two, and the caption of figure two, it says, Model of direct HCV-related B cell transformation, oncogenic effects mediated by intracellular viral proteins. Did you read that correctly, sir? Yes. And at the top of the schematic, they talk about gene mutations, P53, BCL6, CTNNB1. Do you see that, sir? Yes. And they also talk about DNA repair alterations. Now, looking at this section and looking at this diagram, 
Is this talking about the ability of HCV to induce DNA damage and HCV's action to reduce the ability of cells to repair DNA damage? Yes, when the virus infects the cell, those are some of the effects on the cell. And if we go to page 96, and this is going to be in the left-hand column, the second full paragraph, starting with overall. A little higher. Oops, there you go. Okay. And it says, overall, reduced ability of HCV-infected cells to efficiently repair DNA damage coupled with the ability of HCV to induce DNA damages would introduce random rearrangements into the genome leading to predisposition to cancer. Do we read that correctly, sir? Yes. Have you examined Mr. Hardiman's records to see if there was a BCL6 mutation? Um, I have. There, there was a BCL6 gene rearrangement. So, just one little quick aside while we're here, sir. You never examined Mr. Hardiman's actual pathology slides, did you? I tried, but I couldn't get the slides. So, with respect to Mr. Gabayu and Ms. Stevick, you looked at their medical records and the slides. Is that correct? Yes. But for Mr. Hardiman, you looked at only the records and never saw his pathology slides. That's correct. We can go to his medical records, Exhibit 2108. Are you there, sir? Yes. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Two one zero. Second. Okay, I apologize. Well, what we can do, I think the callouts we want to do are going to be okay on this page, but we do want to be mindful. Not, not yet. Not do it. So let us. I think they, he's, yeah, he's taking them down. Thank you. I'm not sure there's anything that's subject, but we'll still, we can walk through it without it being displayed, I think, if everyone can find where we are. So under immunohistochemistry, if everyone's following along because it's not up on the screen for me, but it says collected 2-6-2015, final pathological diagnosis, right neck lympho, lymph node, needle biopsy, Morphologic and immunophenotypic findings consistent with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Do you see that, doctor? Yes. And then if you go down to result, and there is an acronym there that says FISH, F I S H, and it says positive for BCL6 rearrangement in 29%, 29 out of 100 cells, and a deletion of BCL2 in 32% of cells. Is that right, sir? where you're reading. Do you see that, sir? I don't. Okay, let me go through that. You could show me on the screen. Well, we don't want to display it, so what we're, I'm going to need to orient you without it being on the screen. So let me just pull, let me get my physical copy out. You know, I don't, it, 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 the, the question is whether there's anything on this page that is subject to sealing. Exactly. I don't, I actually don't think so, but I'm so concerned about not looking at every line that if you look almost two thirds of the way down, there's the word result. Yes, I see it And now. you see fish. Okay, so just for the record, we are at exhibit 2108, the first page, which has a little 691 in the corner, and about two thirds of the way down or halfway down, there's a word result. Under it, it says fish. 
And there it says, doctor, positive for BCL6 rearrangement in 29, 29 out of 100 cells. Is that correct, sir? Yes. And is that the same BCL6 that is referred to in the coronary article? Yes. Now, you've been previously asked in your theories for Roundup causation whether you know of any translocation, mutation, or deletion that Roundup causes. And yes. do you know that, sir? There is no um, characteristic characteristic genetic abnormality that's been attributed to Roundup. BCL6 um, mutation or rearrangement is a very common finding in diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. Um, but the BCL6 that's referred to in his records is the same BCL6 that's referred to in the coronary article, just the same. Is that right, doctor? Yes. Yeah, just one moment. Your Honor, if we could have the court's indulgence for just one moment. Just one last question, Doctor. As we sit here today, it's true that you cannot cite to any peer-reviewed published article saying that it's generally accepted that exposure to formulated glyphosate causes DLBCL. Is that right? I I don't, I don't know the answer to that question because I haven't reviewed everything that's ever been written, but it's, it's my opinion based on my review of all the literature that I could find that, that glyphosate, formulated glyphosate is a risk factor for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, including diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And so I'll go back to my question. Can you identify any peer-reviewed published article Stating it's generally accepted that exposure to formulated glyphosate causes DLBCL. No, but no, I can't. But um, uh, people have not done careful reviews uh, of this subject. Your Honor, I would, I, just with, just for the record, I'd move to strike everything after no is just non-responsive. like to move into evidence, Exhibit 2108. Which one is that? This is the medical record. Oh, that's fine. Don't touch that. All right. We tender the witness, Your Honor. Okay. Um, first of all, um, just picking up uh, pretty much where you left off, you, you said, or at least I wrote, uh, I wrote this down, I think it's something along the lines of what you said. Uh, BCL6 rearrangement is very common for NHL, and you didn't get any follow-up questions about that. I wanted to right. get some get um, some further explanation from you about that. Well, it's it's one of the most common gene rearrangements that you see in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Probably 30 or more percent of the cases have that specific rearrangement. So it's a common rearrangement, and it's not associated with any specific uh, etiologic uh, agent that we know of. So is there, do you, is, is there anything out there that has looked at whether people who were infected with hep C are more likely to have had um, BCL6 uh, rearrangement than people who were, people who have NHL? and were infected with hep C are more likely to have BCL6 rearrangement than people who have an NHL but were not infected with hep C. I'm not aware of any information, no, that would associate this rearrangement or mutation with hep C, no. Okay. Um, 
you, I, I think in one of your depositions, you may have said that um, Hep C has a roughly six to eight year latency period. Um, that does that. Well, from one of the articles, one of the articles I read uh, found that, okay, uh, but it was a limited number of cases. So um, I, ha I haven't found an article that gave a definitive latency period for hepatitis C and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but it's probably long. I mean, I wouldn't argue with 5 to 35 years with a median of 15 years. It's something like that, 15 to 20 years probably. Okay, and can you just... Um explain again uh, now that you're here on the stand your reasons for ruling out hep c yes so um in my report i referenced um a number of articles that have looked at um the occurrence of non-hodgkin's lymphoma in patients uh, with hepatitis c based on whether they were treated with antivirals and got a sustained virologic response or not, okay? And what those articles demonstrate is that if you're treated, like Mr. Hardiman was, with interferon and antiviral therapy, and you get a sustained virologic response, you're protected from uh, uh, secondary effects of the virus because the virus disappears. And, and you no longer are at significant risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, okay? So that was the major reason that I um, uh, did not consider hepatitis C a major contributing, uh, a major, major contributing factor, okay? What are those articles that, that say that if you, if you get a sustained virological response, the risk disappears? The, the reference in my report. Okay, what, what, can we, can you, can we look at them and um, sure. give me a little more of a description of what each of them says? Let's see, what exhibit is his report again? Sorry, which one? Okay. Okay. So in my report, it would be references uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Um, Wait, hold on. Let's go. Look, first, let's go to the paragraph of your report where you talk about this. Um, well, it's on the third page, bottom of the third page. Okay. Um, So if we just read that last paragraph, if you read that last paragraph, it makes the point. Okay. And then I didn't see any ar articles um, footnoted here. So that there, so, so the, the references th that support this point are listed at the end of your report? No, they're on the fourth line where, um, where it says, um, if you go to the end of the third line, it says, there is no significant increase in risk of NHL for those who are cured with therapy and do not have circulating viral RNA, and it gives references 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And there are actually a couple other references, 5 and 16 also speak to that point. So there are at least seven references okay. that make that point, okay? okay. So, so, I, uh, so you wonder, what, why would that be? I know you've asked some of the other um, uh, experts about how is hepatitis C different than Roundup, right? Right. Because we're saying Roundup is genotoxic and it causes DNA damage. And we're saying that hepatitis C is um, genotoxic and causes DNA damage, right? So the difference is that when you treat a patient with antiviral therapy, um, you, you get rid of the virus, okay? So you get rid of the virus, but also you'll get rid of all the virally infected cells. And the virally infected cells are the cells that have the DNA damage. So those virally infected cells are gone. And most or all of the cells with DNA damage are gone. And that's why you get this, uh, this marked benefit from the antiviral therapy and why you get the 
the, the decreased risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma because you've not only gotten rid of the virus, which is causing the problem, but you've gotten rid of the cells that were infected by the virus, which would be the precursor cells for the lymphoma, okay? So that's how viral infections are different from um, things like Roundup. Because the Roundup cells stick around. At least that's what we s propose they do. They stick around, they get additional hits, and then eventually they become lymphoma. But when you treat the patients with antiviral therapy, the cells, not only is the virus gone, but the cells are killed along with the virus. And, and are, so what you're saying is it's not possible that the, the, the cell damage caused by the virus could set off a chain reaction that eventually gets you to cancer down the road? Right, because once you treat with, with the antiviral therapy, you get rid of the virus and you get rid of the damaged cells. because the virus is infecting the cells. So when you get rid of the virus, the cells die as well. And it's been shown in many studies that when you treat people with antiviral therapy, the clonal cells go away, the cells with the genetic abnormalities go away. Because you've killed, the, not only gotten rid of the virus, but you've killed the cells that are, in, that are infected by the virus. And, and with respect to Mr. Hardiman in particular, how do we know that the virus went away? So the way we know the virus went away is because before he was treated, he had a pretty large viral load, okay? He had a lot of viral RNA in his blood, and he had cirrhosis. After they treated him, very quickly he got uh, a rapid response, and within 12 weeks, the virus was ple completely gone from his blood, okay? Based on what kind of testing? It, wa it was... Um, it's a, it's a very sensitive test for, for viral RNA in the, in the blood. It's a piece, polymerase chain reaction test, so it can detect very low levels of viral RNA. Is that what they refer to as the ELISA or the ELISA test? No, the ELISA test is for the antibody to the virus. So that's a, it's a different test. It tests for whether you have antibodies to the virus. But the, the other test, the test for viral RNA, actually tells you is there, vir is there a viral... RNA um, in, in that person's serum, okay? So, so he had a very rapid response, and then, he, and, and then he was tested over the next five years, and he stayed totally negative. And then when he was tested again at the time he was diagnosed with disease, he was still negative. Um, and then they treated him with um, combination chemotherapy, which is very immunosuppressive and they monitored after his therapy and it never uh, reactivated. So he never reactivated the viral infection uh, after 2005 when he was treated with the antivirals. And that's why I'm saying his risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma would have been markedly lowered because he had this sustained viral response. The cells, the, the damaged cells due to the virus were gone. And, and, and The way you're talking about it now makes it sound like it's kind of a known, agreed upon fact that once you get the virus out of the system, um, the damaged cells go away and there's no longer, the, the risk factor goes away, essentially, right? And Maybe that, a year after or two years after or something like that but it, essentially after a short period of time, the risk factor goes away. It, 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 is, that, is that sort of a known fact that everybody agrees on or is there debate about that in the literature? Well, that's what the papers that I referenced say, that once you treat the patient and they get a sustained virologic response, it means they don't detect the viral RNA anymore, the risk, they, they no longer at, are at risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay, that's what the papers I reference say. And, and it makes sense. That's it, the papers that you ref, what the, the papers that you reference say, but what I'm asking is, is there anything in the literature that stands for the proposition that, hey, actually, it may be that the hep C infection damages the cells in such a way um, that, this, the, that even after the infection is eradicated, 
the 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 the, the cell damage sets off a chain reaction that can lead to NHL um, year, years down the road. Well, I suppose theoretically that is possible if some of those virus infected cells survive. Um, and it's possible that a very small number would be, would, could survive and, and the immune system would hold those in check, okay? Um, but if you look at the, the, the studies that I referenced, seven studies, none of them show that there's a persistent increase in risk after treatment. They all show that the risk goes away. So what that tells you is that if you've had a sustained virologic response to hep C, your risk for uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma goes away, uh, your liver disease stabilizes, uh, and, 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 you, and you have then effectively treated the, the, the hepatitis virus so that it is not gonna cause complications in the future. Let me ask you a, a question that's not about hep C. Um, uh, I think you mentioned that Obesity is a minor risk factor, very minor risk factor for NHL. Is that is that right? Yes. And um, what, what I take that to mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I take that to mean, from a methodological standpoint that when you're looking at potential risk factors for NHL, you have to conduct an assessment of, web, of how major or minor they are. Is that, do you agree with that? Right, so the first thing you do is you, you make a list of all the possible known risk factors, and then you go through the medical history, uh, you go through the medical record, uh, you, 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 you talk to the patients, uh, and you try to see you know, you try to cross off the things that are not in their history. And then you're left with a few things. So with Mr. Hardiman, we were left with um, Roundup, uh, with, vit with <laughs> vitamin C, with hepatitis C. He should have taken vitamin C. Um, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and he was overweight, okay? S so what I did is I said, well, I got these four left. So how do I decide which is the substantial contributing factor, which is the most important risk factor. And it was clear from my review uh, of the literature on hepatitis C that his risk would have decreased dramatically after he had a sustained virologic response to the antiviral therapy, okay? He was at risk when he had the chronic active hepatitis, although it's amazing he never got it. He never got the, the lymphoma over that 40 years, but anyway, he, his risk decreased dramatically after he was treated. So, so uh, I said, well, that probably isn't the cause because you know he, he went for another 10 years and never got lymphoma. Uh, the same story for hepatitis B, okay? Um, he was immune the whole time, so he wasn't at risk for any kind of hepatitis B-associated lymphoma. So that left me with Roundup and with he, him being overweight. And he had um, a very extensive exposure to Roundup over many years, okay? He used lots of Roundup for many years. So to me, uh, looking, comparing that to, to his overweight, his odds ratio for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma based on the NAP study would have been at least two and a half fold increased. And it was probably much higher because his exposure was much higher. Uh, whereas his risk for, um, uh, or his risk from being overweight was only about 30%. So, uh, you know, it's a small risk. So you have something that causes a big risk compared to something that causes a small risk. So I assume that the one that caused the big risk was going to be the most substantial contributing factor. But obesity could have been a minor factor. And, and I'm not entirely ruling out hepatitis C because, yes, maybe there were some cells that survived the treatment, uh, and 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 contributed, but it but it wasn't the substantial contributing cause in in his case. And and so when you're looking at Roundup exposure, one of the things you're looking at it sounds like, and 
placing great emphasis on is the amount of exposure over, over time that the patient experienced. But what about, I mean, not, not all exposures are created equal, right? And the comparison that I've used in, in conversations with prior experts is to smoking, right? I mean, I assume that even somebody who has your view of Roundup would say, well, sustained exposure to cigarette smoke is a lot more dangerous than sustained exposure to Roundup, right? Because the, 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 the science is so much stronger on the link between cigarette smoke and cancer than the link between Roundup and cancer. I mean, you would agree with that, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, so doesn't that need to be part of the specific causation analysis as well? In other words, part of it when you're looking at Roundup is how much was he exposed to it. But part of it is, I would think, in the grand scheme of things, how, you know, how, how uh, significant of a risk factor is this particular agent? You know, is it like, oh my God, we know that there's this definitive and strong link between cigarette smoke and cancer? Or is it one that is, is it a link that is less clear or less developed? Even if you do reach the conclusion, even if you do right, believe right. that there is an association, a, a causal association between Roundup and NHL, wouldn't you need, uh, from a methodological standpoint, to take into account uh, um, sort of the strength uh, of that or, or, or lack of strength of that association compared to other risk factors? Does that question make sense? Yes, it does. It does. So I agree with you that smoking, I think, is a more well-defined and accepted cause of cancer than Roundup exposure. But I think there's a wealth of information on uh, the genotoxicity of glyphosate-based herbicides, the animal studies, studies in humans who've had exposure and, and, and they've seen genotoxic, genotoxicity in living humans, and then the epidemiology studies. You know, it, it goes back to general causation and, 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 and whether it all fits together, and it does. Uh, unfortunately, we don't. The epidemiology st data does not give us the kind of data that you see with smoking, because there are only a few studies. But what it does show is that there is a dose response, and if you have more than two days per year exposure or more than ten days total exposure, uh, um, the odds ratios go up above two, and they're statistically significant. So. Um, so, you know, when you're doing this specific causation, Roundup would be on your list, okay? And if, if it's the only thing on your list after you go through the process of differential etiology, and the, per, and, the, and the case has had extensive exposure over 25, six years with lots of gallons and no precautions, it's logical to, to, to come to the conclusion that more, more likely than not, that was the cause. And so that's the process I went through. And, and that makes sense. Uh, I, I would think, though, that there would be some agents where you would say, well, that's the only risk factor we've been able to identify is this, this, this patient has been exposed to this particular agent over time. Um, but... I'm still not going to conclude that this particular agent caused this particular person's cancer because the evidence of the link between this agent and cancer, while there, is just too weak. It's, it's there, there is an association, but it's, but it's not strong enough for me to just automatically conclude whenever somebody has been exposed to that agent over a sustained period of time, that that must be the cause of their cancer. Would you agree that there are scenarios like that? Yes, there are. And so for each case, you, one, one has to weigh that. But in the end, it's more likely than not 
there being no other causes identified, it's more likely than not that it is the Roundup. That it is the Roundup. And, and, but, but I guess what I'm trying to explore is how much of that opinion that you just expressed is based on a conclusion that you reached at the general causation phase that there's actually quite a strong link between glyphosate and um, NHL. Well, of course, my... If I recall correctly, and I, you can correct me if I'm misremembering, but I think you concluded that not only is there a link between glyphosate and NHL, but there is a very strong link between glyphosate and NHL. And so I, I'm trying to explore now at the specific causation phase how much of your decision not to rule out Roundup or strike that, how much of your decision to conclude that it is Roundup is based on your opinion that it's quite a strong link, that there's quite a strong link between Roundup and NHL as, to po as opposed to maybe a weaker link with some other agent. Well, I think when you do the differential etiology, whether it's a strong link or a less strong link or even a weak link, in the end, when you, when you go through your list and it's the only link left, then you know, the conclusion is more likely than not that was the cause. Now, you can't be 100% sure, but, but you know, in the end, um, I think... That's the way physicians think, okay? I mean, but, you, you try to come to a diagnosis that is the best diagnosis, and then you say, you know, and if you don't have a diagnosis, then you say, well, I don't know what caused it. But, but I guess I'm, I'm, having, uh, I'm having a little trouble wrapping my mind around that one because I would think that if you, you know, if there are, let's say we're aware of 10 things that where there might be a link between, you know, exposure to that thing and a particular cancer. And we examine somebody's history and we conclude that they were only exposed to one of the things. And the, the one thing that they were exposed to, the link between that thing and cancer is pretty, pretty weak. There, it's there, there's, there's some evidence in the literature to, to suggest that there's a link, but it's, the evidence is pretty weak. On the other hand, we have a lot of people where we say we don't know how their cancer was caused. I would think that in a hypothetical scenario like that, you might examine that person and that person's history and say, well, yeah, they were exposed to this one thing, but it doesn't automatically mean that we can conclude that that more likely than not caused their cancer. We, what, the only thing we can safely conclude is that we don't know what caused their cancer. We haven't identified with, you know, with, with any certainty what caused their cancer. Um, is that type of analysis possible, hypothetically, not in the, I'm not talking about the Roundup context now, I'm just talking about hypothetically, is that type of analysis possible in your field and within your methodology? Well, yes it is, and, and it, I think it goes back to the, to the, to the initial, um, uh, interpretation of all the general causation data uh, and um, if you believe that Roundup causes NHL, can cause NHL, then and you, you believe that there's strong evidence, which I think there is, uh, then you would use that to, in your interpretation of specific causation, sure. If you didn't think Roundup caused NHL, you didn't believe the data or you thought it was insufficient, uh, then you probably wouldn't even put Roundup on your list, or you'd put it up. You might put it up there, but then, right? But that's the that's what I'm trying to get at. Is 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 there a scenario where it's you know there's there's enough in the epidemiological and other scientific evidence to put it up there, but if you engage in this process and you rule out everything else, you would say, yeah, you know, it's up there, but the but the but the evidence isn't strong enough for me to to conclude that this person's cancer was caused by Roundup. Rather, what I'm left to conclude is that we don't know what caused this person's cancer. I'm, and I'm, oh, so I, I'm asking, I know that that's not your opinion with respect to Roundup because you believe from a general causation standpoint that the evidence is strong. 
but I'm asking if there's room for that in your methodology. Well, I, in, I think in general, I th yes, I think there would be uh, if if my opinion was that Roundup may not be a cause of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or may be a very weak risk factor for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, then I might come to that kind of conclusion. Like with obesity. I yeah, mean, if, exactly. If all you had was that Mr. Hardiman was overweight would you, and you didn't have, and he had never been exposed to Roundup, what would your conclusion be about Mr. Hardiman? It would be that you know, his obesity probably contributed to his getting NHL, but I'm, I wouldn't be really sure whether it was the cause. Uh, it, prob you know, it probably contributed, but it's a, so weak, it's a weak risk factor. So would you say that it's more, uh, more likely than not um, uh, uh, Mr. Hardiman's NHL was, m excuse me, more likely than not Mr. Hardiman's obesity was a significant factor in causing his NHL? Probably wouldn't because it's such a re weak risk factor. It probably wouldn't. So if we didn't take Mr. Hardiman's case, if we didn't have any exposure to Roundup, but we had everything else with, with, with respect to Mr. Hardiman, what would your conclusion be about him? Well, um, I think he would have been unlikely to have gotten non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It probably wouldn't okay, have. Let's say he it had. wouldn't have been much different than whatever the background rate is. But there are Maybe. people. There are many people who are diagnosed with non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and the conclusion is we don't know how they got it. Yes. Right. Okay. So w get. So I. It, is it still your testimony that somebody without the Roundup exposure could not have gotten non-Hodgkin lymphoma? And had everything else that Mr. Hardiman had? Well, it's, it's possible they could get it. Right. it, it we, we wouldn't know what caused it. Okay, so what I'm asking you is, assume Mr. Hardiman has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and has all the other factors in his medical history, except for the Roundup. What, do you, what would your opinion be of Mr. Hardiman's, uh, of the cause of Mr. Hardiman's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? I, I, I wouldn't really know. Uh, you know, I would say, well, perhaps the hepatitis C contributed, but it's unlikely that it played a substantial role. Uh, I would say that he was obese, so that could have contributed, but it probably didn't play a substantial role. So it would be a situation where we have a couple risk factors that are not very convincing, uh, where the risk is not much increased. And so in the end, you'd say, well, we're not sure, just, just as you as you, you know, described in the other scenario. Okay. Um, should, we, should we take a, a little bit of a break maybe? And then um, I'm happy to, uh, I don't know, I guess you can, you can begin and then if you all have any cleanup that you want to do, you can, you can do that. Um, so why don't we take a 10 minute break? We'll resume at 11 o'clock. 
Okay, you can proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. Weisenberger. Morning. The court um, was asking you some questions about your methodology, and I wanted to follow up on a few things regarding your methodology. In general, did you apply the same methodology for all three of the plaintiffs, uh, Mr. Mr. Hardman, Mr. Gepiahu, and Ms. Stevick? Yes, I did. And can you just explain the process of the methodology for all three of those plaintiffs without going into particular details for each one of them? Right, so the method is, in medicine, it's called differential diagnosis. In legal situations, it's called differential etiology. It's sort of the same method in which you um, have- Sorry to interrupt, but is, isn't it the reverse? That in, in, in medicine, it's called differential etiology, and in the, the law, it's called differential diagnosis? No. Okay. In your in your clinical practice, if, if you were going to try to figure out the diagnosis for a patient, what do you call that process? Differential diagnosis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so in, in the legal context, when you're trying to determine the cause of NHL for these three particular plaintiffs, explain what the process is that you go through. Right. So the... The patient has a specific disease, and you're trying to understand what caused the disease. I'm really sorry to interrupt, but I just, and it, this is a minor point, but I, I think it's important for courts to describe these things correctly. When you're trying to diagnose a particular patient, you call it, and you're conducting that analysis, you call it differential diagnosis. But trying to diagnose a patient is uh, different from trying to figure out what caused the patient's disease. And so I'm asking what is the appropriate label you attach to the exercise of trying to uh, figure out what caused a, a patient's disease where you already know what the disease is? Yes, so I think the terms are interchangeable. I mean, in medicine, we say differential diagnosis, but it really, that, in for some- figuring, For figuring out what caused somebody's disease? Yeah, also for that, yes. Okay. But, but you could call it differential etiology because that's actually what we're doing. We're trying to figure out, for example, what, what organism, what bacteria caused a, bac uh, a pneumonia. So it's sort of differential etiology. But in medicine, we call it differential diagnosis. Okay. And so- Sorry. When, that's fine, Your Honor. Um, when determining what the cause of NHL is for these three plaintiffs, just walk the court through what the methodology is that you used. Right. So um, you begin with a disease, so we'll say non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and you, um, you know, in a, in, in, in a case like this, you, you look through the medical records you read through the medical records, uh, you read through, um, if there are depositions, you read, dep read through the depositions of the physicians and other caretakers. Um, y y you um, talk to the patient uh, and try to uh, elicit any additional um, information. And you have a list of known accepted causes of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And so based on um, what you find out from the medical records, from the physician's records, from the depositions, from talking to the patient, you can usually exclude most of the diagnoses uh, or etiologies on the list. And, and then you come down to just a few, and then you have to use your medical expertise and your knowledge of the literature uh, and um, and some judgment to 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 weigh things in a way that you um, come up with the most likely uh, etiology. And is that, in fact, Dr. Weisenberg, what you did in these three cases? Yes, it is. And so, when you when you come up with your list of known accepted causes, is that what you've been referring to as the risk factors for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yes, causative risk factors. And, and simply because something is a, a risk factor, a known risk factor, does that mean it's automatically going to be the substantial factor in a particular case? No. Okay. What's your process for determining 
whether any of the known risk factors that you've got up on your checklist then becomes how do you determine what the substantial factor is in a particular case? Well, that, that's also complex because um, some risk factors are strong risk factors uh, and some are weaker risk factors. And uh, of course, you have to really determine whether the patient um, has that risk factor and has had an extent, for example, if it's a chemical, have they had an extensive exposure to the chemical over many years? Um, or was it just, uh, you know, once or twice in their lifetime? And so you have to, you have to decide whether the risk factor stays up on the list or it doesn't based on what the patient tells you, what their exposures were. And for these three plaintiffs, um, did you include Roundup, um, did you rule in Roundup as one of those risk factors to consider? Yes. Okay. And what did you rely upon in forming your opinion that you should rule in Roundup as a risk factor for these three plaintiffs? Well, it was based on my review of all the materials for general causation. To that I came to the conclusion that Roundup is a significant risk factor for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and, and then looking at the exposure of each of the three individuals to see did they have extensive exposure, uh, a little bit of exposure, almost no exposure, uh, and, and then, you know, based on that, determining whether Roundup still is uh, a substantial, if they had a lot of exposure and you accept it as a risk factor, then, then you have to leave it up on the list. And you were asked several questions by Monsanto's counsel regarding the McDuffie and Erickson studies when they talk about two days per year or 10 lifetime days. Do you recall those questions? Yes. Okay. And, and can you explain to the court how you factored in the McDuffie and Erickson studies in forming your opinions in these three cases? Well, I selected those two studies plus the NAP study because those were the three studies that showed a dose response. In other words, it said people who have more exposure um, have a higher risk of disease. So I, th so I tried to determine whether each of these three individuals would fall into the category have, of having a high exposure, which would put them ex at significant risk for this disease. And they, and they all three, uh, had exposures markedly above these so-called thresholds that are set by these, two, these three epidemiology studies. And those thresholds, so that's, that's the dose response? It's, yeah, it's the odds ratio for the dose response. And what is the odds ratio for the dose response in the McDuffie and Erickson studies tell you? Well, the dose response is really an important um, parameter that that we evaluate in epidemiology because if a chemical has a, shows a dose response, it's very likely uh, an etiologic agent because uh, it's, you know, it's, it's unusual that a, that a chemical would cause a disease and not have a dose response. So when you see a dose response, that gives you some assurance that, the, that it really is causing the uh, disease. And what were the findings of the dose response for McDuffie and Erickson? So they w were both positive. And did you rely on that in forming your opinion to rule in Roundup in these three cases? Yes. Okay. Could I ask one follow-up question about that? I forgot to ask you earlier. Um, on the issue of dose response, you mentioned um, that Mr. Hardiman's uh, exposure was much greater than um, uh, uh, twice per year for five years, which is sort of this baseline. And I think you said that therefore um, his risk is probably greater than two. Do I remember that correctly? Yes. But I assume, and I, it's been a long time since I've looked at the Erickson study and the McDuffie study, but um, if I recall correctly, it's not the case that the people being studied 
that resulted in a conclusion that there was an odds ratio of 2.0 or whatever the number was for people who had had more than um, twice a year exposure or 10 lifetime days exposure merely had that kind of exposure. In other words, I think that a lot of the people in the pool of people studied that resulted in the 2.0 odds ratio had the kind of exposure that Mr. Hardiman had or, or more. So isn't it incorrect to say, I assume that Mr. Hardiman's risk is greater than 2.0 because his exposure was so much more than 10 lifetime days? Well, I'm surmising. I mean, I don't really know. Ideally, you'd like to... But to isn't it incorrect to surmise that? Because, because there are lots of people in the pool from McDuffie and Erickson and the NAP that, study. That had high exposure, sure. Exposure was much higher, yeah. and presumably much higher than Mr. Hardiman's as well, yes. right? So, so what you have is only two, two groups. You've got a group that's less than two days and greater than equal two days. And what you'd really like to have is four or five groups stratified to really see a dose response. But we don't have that kind of data. Other than the AHS. Other than the AHS, yes. Um, but uh, um, so, so my qu I want to I want to get a ask you point blank: Was that statement you made previous earlier today incorrect? That we should assume that Mr. Hardiman's uh, risk factor is greater than two because he his exposure was so much higher than ten lifetime days. I don't I don't know. It was hypothetical. It was a hypothetical. It may have, it probably was correct, but I can't prove it. Well, wouldn't you, to, to be able to make a statement like that, wouldn't you have to know the exposure rates of the pool that was studied in McDuffie and Erickson? Yes, yes, you would. You would. So, yeah, I, you know, maybe I should have made that statement, but, you know, in terms of the, the way chemicals, carcinogenic chemicals work, the more exposure you have, the higher your risk. And they had only two categories. So you've got sort of a low risk and a high risk group. And, but you don't, have a, you don't have a real high risk group because the real high risk group is in your other group. So it would be nice to have more data to see that, but we, have, oh, we only have what we have. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Weisenberger, is it a fair statement to say that Mr. Hardiman's exposure exceeded the categories in both the McDuffie and the Erickson studies. Yes. What you, you testified earlier that you can you ruled out um, all the the known possible risk factors for NHL for Mr. Hardiman um, with the exception of that left you with obesity, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and Roundup. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and did you do the same analysis for Mr. Gebiahu? Yes. And what were you left with when you went through, based on your medical review of the records, your interview with him, and your review of the literature, what were you left with? I was left with Roundup and with Hepatitis B. And you testified earlier about how you eliminated Hepatitis B from the differential for Mr. Hardiman. Is the same true for Mr. Gebiahu? Yes. And, and why is that, Mr. Dr. Weisenberger? Well, again, because the, the literature on the subject shows that um, if you are immune, if you have natural immunity to hepatitis B or you're immunized uh, against hepatitis B, uh, you're, you have no increased risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So it's just like hepatitis C, it's only those who have chronic active infection that are at in increased risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And given that, were you able to form an opinion in Mr. Gabiahu's case as to whether, as, as to what the cause of his NHL was? Yes, I thought it was more likely than not the Roundup. And in Mr. Hardiman's case, um, based on your review and determination that he was immune to hepatitis B at least since 2005, um, were you able to form an opinion as to ruling out hepatitis B as a substantial factor? Yes. And what was your opinion? Well, 
my, my opinion was that it wasn't a substantial contributing factor, that it could have been a contributed, but I didn't think it was uh, a substantial contribution. It was more like obesity or even less than obesity in terms of the way I weighed it. And so for Mr. Hardiman, after your review of his records, your interview with him, um, your review of the literature, were you able to form an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical probability as to what the substantial factor in causing his NHL is? Okay. I'm, I'm, I've got like two more questions. Okay, thank you. Yes, I believe it was Roundup. And for Ms. Stevick, were you able to form an opinion within a reasonable degree of medical probability as to what the substantial factor was in causing her NHL? Yes, I also felt it was Roundup. There, there weren't any other um, uh, etiologic factors that I could identify uh, in her history. Thank you, Dr. Weisenberg. Thank you, Your Honor. Hi, Dr. Weisenberger. Hi. Let me go to Exhibit 2107. It's your Adams deposition at page 112. All right. We'll move on from that. Uh, I want to ask you a couple questions on the hepatitis C subject first. Okay. So when Mr. Hardiman was diagnosed in February of 2015, and treatment was initiated. He was not just given chemotherapy, was he? He was, he was also given medication to make sure that his hepatitis C infection would not flare up. Was he not? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, his NHL diagnosis. When he began treatment. I'll restate the question. I will. No, no, no. I think that's good. Thank you. When Mr. Hardman was diagnosed with NHL in February of 2015. They did not just initiate treatment for his chemotherapy. They also initiated a prophylactic treatment to ensure that his hepatitis C infection would not flare up. Did they not? Well, it's not correct. So um, at the time they diagnosed him, they looked in his blood and they found that he didn't have any evidence of hepatitis C infection and they found that he didn't have any evidence of hepatitis B infection, okay? But the prophylactic treatment was given for hepatitis B, but not for hepatitis C. It may, it may have helped with the hepatitis C, but it was given mainly for hepatitis B. Okay, so when you say there's a prophylactic treatment, you were talking about one or two viruses that you were saying were eliminated, but a prophylactic treatment was administered. Well, it was administered empirically because um, we know that some patients with hepatitis B and some patients with hepatitis C have a, a latent infection. That is, you don't completely get rid of the virus. The virus lives in the body at a very low level and is kept in check by the immune system. And so whenever they give chemotherapy uh, and patients have a history of hepatitis B, they, they don't want that virus to flare up when the immune system is knocked down. So they, they give the, uh, they give the uh, antiviral uh, therapy empirically just to prevent that from happening in case it might. So going back to our point about how cancer can exist below a detectable level, there are viruses that can live in the body below a detectable level. Yes, that is, is that correct? That is correct. Now, there was some discussion about hepatitis C and the efficacy of interferon as it relates to regression. Is that right, sir? You were testifying about how the treatment of hepatitis C with interferon is something that was seen to be effective in the regression of low-grade lymphomas, is that right? Well, I didn't say that, but that's true. Right, they're low-grade lymphomas. So yes. if you have an intermediate or if you have a high level, interferon 
is not going to do it. Usually people don't do it. it. It does sometimes work, but people don't usually do it, at least in our country. Right. The treatment modality is still chemotherapy. Yes. And in looking at how HCV, the mechanisms by which it can cause NHL, if we can go back to the Horane article, which is Exhibit 2052. In our earlier conversation, we were talking about Figure 2, which relates to the potential for a, the ability of HCV to directly cause mutations and to prevent DNA repair. Is that right, Doctor? Yes. But now I want to look at Figure 1. So if we could have Daubert Exhibit 2052, Figure 1. We can call out Figure 1. And here we're talking about HCV-related B cell transformation through the continuous external stimulation of lymphocytes receptors by viral antigens and cytokines. Is that correct, Your Honor? Uh, is that correct, Doctor? Yes. So with reference to the efficacy of interferon, are we talking about here uncontrolled cell growth, which could lead to spontaneous mutations for which interferon has been deemed to be effective? Is that this model of uncontrolled cell growth triggered by HCV? So there are two models in this paper, two major models. One is the one we talked about earlier where the virus actually infects the cell, gets inside the cell and takes over the workings of the cell. And in the first one, the one you just pointed me to, figure one, they think that the virus attaches to the cell but doesn't actually infect the cell. Okay, so it attaches to the cell by these external receptors, either the CD81 or the BCR immunoglobulin receptor, and stimulates the cell to proliferate and, um, and as a result of that you can also have some genetic abnormalities that are occur. This model that you're talking about in Figure 1, they, they, they believe really applies to the low-grade B-cell lymphomas and not diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The and second model we discussed earlier is the model that they really think uh, is the model that uh, is applicable to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Okay. And when you talk about the low-grade lymphomas, again, we're going back to the low-grade lymphomas for which interferon treatment has been deemed to be effective. Right, doctor? Yes. Okay. So, treatment with interferon to reduce the viral load, decrease the amount of virus that can attach to these cells, and cause uncontrolled cell growth. Is that right, sir? Right. Okay. Figure two, we can go to figure two, where, where we were before. We can call this out. And again, this is just to be clear, model of direct HCV-related B cell transformation, oncogenic effects mediated by intracellular viral proteins. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And when we talk about the gene mutations caused by HCV, and we're talking about the ability of the HCV to keep the cells from repairing DNA damage, those are actual mutations, correct? Mutations is one of the forms of genetic damage, yes. So there are breaks, there, there are deletions, there are translocations, there are all kinds of genetic abnormalities. Mutations is one, just one type. And I think in your testimony in the Hardeman deposition, you said 25 to 40 years of chronic HCV in infection could cause mutations, and those mutations would continue. Well, they, they could continue, exactly, but, but, but if you use this mo the model in figure two, as I explained earlier, if you treat the viral infection, the virus goes away, and the cells that are infected with the virus die because they're infected with the virus. So when you get in there and kill the virus, you kill the cell. So, so those cells don't persist, okay? Or if, they, or if they do persist, they're at very, very low levels, 
as a form of latent infection that is kept in check by the immune system, okay? But latent That's infection. why I didn't entirely rule out hepatitis C because you could have a latent infection and you could have some of these virally infected cells still persisting, hiding, afraid to come out because the immune system's waiting for them. So we know a latent infection can maintain, we know mutations can maintain, that came from a chronic 25, multi-decade period of HCV infection. It's, it's possible at a very low level, okay, at a very low level. We don't have any evidence of that in Mr. Hardiman because he never uh, had any evidence of infection after he was treated. But hypothetically, theoretically, yes, there could have been some small few latent uh, virally infected cells hiding in, right. in his system. And empirically as well, which is why doctors go forward on the understanding that these things could still exist and, and adjust their treatment modalities accordingly. Yes. Okay, if we could go to Exhibit 2070, please, which is the Mahali article. Um, this should already be in evidence. And you were asked about this at your deposition, I think you recall, Doctor, the Mahali article. And if we could go to page seven of this article. And if we could go down to the, the third full paragraph on that page, the last sentence, or maybe the last few sentences, we, we observed after footnote 25. We observed. Now this is a 2018 article, is that correct? Yes, <clears throat> yes. And it says, we observed that ABT with SVR led to a moderate reduction in risk of B-cell NHLs when compared to untreated patients. And then they have a sentence about HIV. And then the last sentence, however, this risk reduction was not observed when ABT was started two or more years after the HCV index date. Did I read that correctly? Yes. And there's been a determination of, wait, hold on, strike that. May I have just one moment, Your Honor? Sure. And doctor, you first considered Mahali, which is a 2018 article, at your deposition. You had not included this in your report, is that correct? That's correct. We have no further questions. Sure. Sure. Dr. Weisenberger, just to follow on the line of questioning about hepatitis C, do we know, do, do you have an opinion as to what percentage of people with active hepatitis C infection actually develop non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yes, it's a very low percentage. It's, uh, it's about one-tenth of one percent. So it's, it's not a very strong risk factor either. And there were several questions about the cell mutations, the damage to the cells caused by hepatitis C. And you were asked some hypothetical questions and then questions about Mr. Hardiman. I just want to make sure we're clear. With respect to Mr. Hardiman, what is your opinion as to what happened following the hepatitis C treatment he received in 2005 and 2006 to those cells, the damaged cells? Well, based on the references that I, I used in my report and in my knowledge of this disease and, and actually this nice paper that we've been discussing, um, uh, it, it, was, it, it was my opinion that when he was treated, his risk for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma markedly decreased, okay, to, to the point where these studies that were done couldn't detect an increased risk, okay. So I didn't feel that hepatitis C uh, really met the criteria for a strong risk factor in Mr. Hardiman, even though he had it for a long time. It, it, you know, he had it for many years. It, 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 uh, it, he was markedly responsive to treatment, and once you respond to treatment, uh, your risk for uh, 
hepatitis C related sequelae uh, are go down dramatically. And, and how, how do we know if the treatment he received for hepatitis C actually killed off the cells that may have been damaged by the virus for Mr. Hardiman? Well, because the cells are infected. So when you attack the virus, you're attacking the cell that the virus is in, and it kills the cell. Uh, or in the first model that we talked about in figure one, if you take away the stimulus to s tell the cells to proliferate, they stop proliferating and they die off, okay? And after the treatment Mr. Hardman received in 2005 and 2006, which would have killed off the damaged cells, has there ever been any evidence since then that he had active hepatitis C? No. And did you factor that into your decision in determining that hepatitis C was not a substantial factor in causing NHL for Mr. Hardiman? Yes, I did. And Dr. Weisenberger, um, in forming your case of it, opinions in these three cases, did you rely upon the publications that you have either authored or co-authored uh, regarding NHL? Um, one or two, but uh, for the most part, I was relying on uh, research done by others. Approximately how many peer-reviewed publications have you authored or co-authored about causes of NHL? Well, 50 or so. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Just to be clear, sir, Mr. Hardiman's NHL is a high grade. It was not a low grade lymphoma, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Step down. <coughs> okay, is there anything else that uh, anybody needs to discuss today, or should we just plan on seeing each other again on Wednesday morning? I don't have anything further. I think it can wait till the pretrial conference on Wednesday. I think Mr. Seitloff had a couple matters. Sure. Yeah, just a couple um, questions for guidance, John. Or, uh, um, a couple questions in preparing for the um, trial preservation deposition of Dr. Portier. Do, in trial, do you allow recross of expert witnesses? I think that I always have. Okay. Yeah, and I think it would be appropriate in this case. Thank you. Um, also, if we want to, um, I mean, I understand there might be debates later about whether something was proper impeachment, but if we wanted to impeach an expert, and this is true, I guess, not only in Dr. Portier's testimony but at trial can we use video on occasion or do, or are we are we stuck with the transcript certainly I mean I'm, I'm thinking about you know this came up in, in the last civil trial that I did and I I believe that I ruled that video could not be used but it was more based on you know, the specifics of that case. I have not developed a general rule about that one way or the other. I would think that there would need to be you know, now that I think about it, I think I have on a number of occasions allowed <coughs> video to be used. You're talking about for expert witnesses or witnesses in general? I think we're focused on expert witnesses and to be clear, I don't think every time we impeach a witness we would we would use video, but there might be some occasions where a witness in the video, um, either through his or her facial reactions or pauses, the impeachment would come across differently than it might if you just look at it on paper. And so I think we're just trying to test whether the, in limited instances that we think might be appropriate, we could use Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Our only concern there, Your Honor, would just be the time constraints that we put on. We just don't want that to interfere. Yeah, so. but of course, if, if, if they that's, are... That's them. It's their time. Fair it's their point. Clock. That actually, so I only have two more brief things, Your Honor. I, I just wanted to flag for Your Honor, and I'm not exactly sure how to deal with this. Um, I think you might hear more from them about it on Wednesday, but they designated for phase one 36 hours of deposition designation testimony. So we are now going through the process of countering and objecting to that. That seems like a poor use of resources given that they are limited to 32 hours. I guess maybe I'm more just flagging it for you, but I think that we are concerned about the amount of resources we are putting into um, marking up transcript of 36 hours of testimony given I don't think that there will be 36 hours of deposition designation testimony. Kind of the opposite of 
uh, uh, just dumping a ton of documents on them and making them spend all their resources sifting <laughs> through the documents. I'm sure that's never happened in this case. We, we've never experienced that, Your Honor. Uh, uh, Your Honor, there's, there's 67 witnesses disclosed or listed between the two parties. Um, and so, you know, given the bifurcation issue and the fact there's 67 witnesses, I think there's 34 or so depositions. We did our best to narrow it down. Um, and I appreciate them counting up the hours. I hadn't done that yet, but, um, but, but we'll get there. I, I did, since you mentioned the 32 hour last week, we went back and in the Johnson case, there were over 50 hours. It might've been close to 55. I'm not exactly sure on that of trial time that was allotted for that case. Um, the plaintiff in that case did have more hours allocated because we have the burden of proof. So we wanted to bring that to your honor's attention and we can talk about it more on Wednesday. Hours it was over, over 50. Of over 50 the, total hours of trial No, time? over 50 for the plaintiff, for the plaintiff, your honor. I'm, I apologize, over 50 for the plaintiff. Um, since that time, we've taken multiple depositions in the litigation, um, four of which were just last month. I think there's eight or nine scheduled for this month before trial. So some of those designations are part of that. So there's even more or evidence. More, the fact that you took more depositions doesn't mean you need more time. Well, that's a fair point, Your Honor. Um, I mean, there's a witness they identified that for the first time, we just got the custodial file last week on their list. Um, we don't know if they're gonna call her or not. So I'm just saying that right now with 32 hours, that is, basically hands you know tying our hands behind our back and so we would ask the court to reconsider that to give us more time so we can present our evidence um, and make sure we meet the burden of proof well we can talk about that more at the pre-trial conference but i okay. will tell you that so far i've not seen anything that to, to suggest that it should be that it should be expanded um, and in fact what what i think we're, we're going to find is that you know uh, there are a number of expert witnesses who are either not going to testify at all for my rulings or their testimony is going to be dr much shorter than what is contemplated by their reports um, and so that should provide some uh, assistance to both sides I, I understand your honor I just want to put that on the record so thank you your honor um, and uh, and as I said uh, and uh, as is always the case if I do conclude along the way that I've squeezed you unnecessarily we, we can do something about it and we don't have to wait until the end of trial to do something about it either and part of it depends on you know whether people are using their time efficiently I, and I appreciate that your honor and we have every intention of using our time efficiently I mean we want to make sure that we're mindful of the jury sitting here for a long time too but I just want the court to be aware with that number of witnesses and then what happened in the Johnson case we just wanted to to bring that to your attention especially when we talked about last week you know 10 to 12 hours for Dr. Portier in Australia I mean that's a third of the hours allocated to us so that just want to bring that to your attention we can talk more about it on Wednesday you're gonna to need to chop that testimony well that, inc that and that includes that includes the defense I, I apologize Ron. And, and we're chopping our cross already we've, we've mapped it out and are confident we can fit our case in the 32 hours um, and uh, you know but part of it here is that we are you know we, the, the, there's an obligation on both sides to you know obviously we need you need to be able to put enough evidence in front of the jury for, to allow the jury to make an informed decision, but you also have an obligation to these members of the community um, who are giving up uh, a month and maybe more of their lives um, to, to present the evidence efficiently. Um, and that, of course, is always something we have to think about in these, in these cases, um, both civil and criminal, in my opinion. So, um, uh, the other issue that I guess we may need to talk about with respect to time is are there going to be time limits for the different phases or is that just going to be left up to each side and I don't know if you want to we, we you want I don't know if you want to talk about that now or on Wednesday or if we neither. could I'm, I'm sorry your honor if we could talk about it on Wednesday because that's part of you know when we do the deposition designations some people are going to be played in both phases and so that you know we're trying to be as efficient as we can but we also have to meet our burden and so we can if we could talk about that on Wednesday just to give some more guidance that would be great and and then we can also meet and confer with the defense to see if there's some witnesses they're not going to call and that might help us too and we can likewise we can do the same okay so what are the things we need to talk about on Wednesday um, 
One is the um, the non-expert related summary judgment motion. Um, the, this, the summary judgment motion relating to the statute of limitations. Yes. How do you pronounce the plaintiff's name? Gavayu? Okay. That's what I thought. Um, <coughs> so a anyone is free to argue that, that issue, whether it's, whether it's you all or you. Is it Mr. Sadek? Whoever wants to argue that issue is free to argue that issue, both of you. Um, so we have that issue. We have the uh, plaintiffs, in no particular order, the plaintiffs' uh, specific causation experts. Monsanto's uh, specific causation experts. The other experts, which again, I may or may not want argument on, and I'll try to get some guidance out to you in advance. That would be great. Thank you, Your Honor. Motions in limine. And Your Honor, there are maybe two to four that we've agreed to, it might be three to four. So we can, we can probably move through some of those. There's a, the case civic ones we can move through pretty quickly, I would think. Sorry, what? The case civic ones for Mr. Harden, we can probably move through pretty quickly on Wednesday because um, that's where we have a couple of stipulations. Collateral source has been stipulated to, um, and then smoking has been stipulated to, to leave out references to smoking history. Okay, so, so so can you do me a favor? And I haven't I haven't read the motions in limine yet, and that's next on my list of things to do. So, but could you file a letter by the end of the day, um, updating us on whether you have any agreements um, that that are not reflected in the papers you've already filed? I think that they're reflected already in the papers. I mean, I'm happy to file a letter, but nothing has happened since the filings that, on the 31st. That, that's correct, Your Honor, but if you want it in one place, no, I mean, no, it wouldn't take much time. But that's fine. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Um, so motions in limine, um, jury instructions, uh, verdict form for phase one, obviously. Uh, is there anything else we are going to need to be talking about on Wednesday? We talked about um, perhaps going over some of the exhibit objections in categories, and we did talk, we had a meet and confer about whether to come up with some categories. So we'll get that nailed down before Wednesday so we can present, um, Your Honor, with some categories for discussion on Wednesday. Okay. And, you know, it might be helpful if you could just, without any argument uh, or anything, if you could just file a letter you know, tomorrow or something, uh, maybe tomorrow by noon, uh, saying, you know, here are the categories of, you know, here are the categories of exhibits we'd like to discuss or, cat, you know, the, the categories of issues we'd like to discuss relating to the exhibits. So for, for example, one is peer-reviewed literature. I mean, there's some peer-reviewed literature on the exhibit list. So we just want to know, we want guidance from your honor as to that being an exhibit at trial. So, so if, can it just be as brief as, the, as that? Yes, please, okay. only absolutely as brief as that. Wonderful. You know, just to get, get me to start thinking about it. I suspect we may agree that just on that one where, for example, all these articles, they can be shown to the jury, but then they may not be sent back, to, admitted for purposes of being sent back to the jury during their deliberations. Because that, that's my reading of the learned treatise. Why don't, you why don't you file a joint letter on that by... Um, uh, noon tomorrow again without any argument but just identifying the issues that you that are presented by the exhibits or That's by fine. Gr you know groups of exhibits that you'd like me you know pick like your five most important or something along those lines okay thank you your honor okay anything else just briefly um one question and one well can we confirm what time we start on wednesday uh, are we doing all of this at 1 30 i think that i've Think there have been differing, or are we starting in the morning? I'm just oh, I thought we were. Um, I thought we were planning on starting in the morning, and then I was assuming we might need to take a lunch break and then resume in the afternoon. Um, uh, and I don't 
take up first, probably, probably Timmy will take up the statute of limitations issue first, um, and then do, you know, the, the, uh, maybe in roughly the order that I, that I just listed them, but I don't, I don't think it particularly matters. Okay. And then just one last issue, Your Honor. Um, as you know. So we'll start at, should we start at 9.30? So basically, it's just get here at 9.30, and, and we'll, we'll figure it out from there Perfect. how to proceed. Thank you. And then last issue on my Ready to discuss everything in the morning. If we can get through everything in the morning, wonderful. Great. Um, so as you know, many of the documents have confident. Oh, I apologize. I just want to say this while it, before I forget it. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Remember that the jurors are coming on Wednesday to fill out the questionnaires as well. So everybody, you, you should avoid any discussion of the case in the hallways or the elevator or, I mean, I know you would anyway, but hallways, elevator, cafeteria, just everybody should avoid discussing the case at all for fear of being overheard by a prospective juror. Go ahead. Many of the documents have subject to protective order confidentiality designations on them. A lot of them are the internal company documents that have been produced. Um, we have asked the plaintiffs to remove those markers, those stamps that say subject to protective order confidential, confidential for trial purposes, which is pretty easy to redact. They have stated that they will not do so. Our, my concern is that that is trying, whether explicitly or not, to suggest to, suggest to the jury. That Monsanto is trying to keep it hidden. Yes, and so I think we're asking Your Honor to order them to remove those designations yeah, I, for I trial. I certainly think they should be. Your Honor, I mean, that's how they produce the documents to us. Um, so, of course. I'm sorry? Of course that's how they produce yeah. the documents. Uh, th going back to the documents, how many documents produced. Um, and those documents have been used in depositions with the confidential stamp at the bottom. So we've both designated multiple depositions to play at trial, and of course the exhibits with those depositions, we would move for entry into evidence as an exhibit, and so they're, they've already been used and referenced in those depositions with that confidential stamp at the bottom. So that's why we object to that. Um, well, what, what does that have to do with what the jury needs to see or not see? Well, it was their choice, Your Honor, to put the confidential designation on there. Um, and Else? The only thing I would add, Your Honor, is if, you're, if, you, if your ruling is to remove the confidential designation, that that burden be placed on Monsanto because they are the ones that put it on there. And we're talking, you know, many, many documents. Um, and so if they want confidentiality removed. You, you're the one who needs to make the decision about what uh, exhibits you're going to use at trial, right? And I assume that's not narrowed down in a particularly meaningful way by now. Um, but during the course of trial, it's going sure. to narrow down. And before you use a document, you need to, you know, whether it's the night before a witness comes on or the, you know, a couple of days before a witness come on, you're, comes on, you're going to narrow down the number of documents that you might use with that witness. And when you do that, you can remove okay. the, the designation of confidential. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Oh, wait, hold on. Well, the, the problem is that, that right now they're at, they're at a stage in their trial preparations right now where they have a thousand possible documents that they're going to use, and they'll only end up using you know fifty of them. Or I'm making up the numbers, right. but it's probably more like but ten thousand and a hundred, right? <laughs> or ten thousand and two hundred. Um, so it, it doesn't make sense to make them go through and remove the confidentiality designations now, unless that's unless that's easy. Unless that's somehow mechanically easy to do, and I, I assume that it's not. It, I wouldn't say it would be, Your Honor. I think my staff would appreciate not having to do that at this juncture. I mean, we'll we'll get Miss Mellon copies of exhibits that are redacted as soon as we, as we can. Um, I think we've agreed to exchange them. Forty. We there's there's sufficient time between when the witness will be on the stand and when those exhibits would be ready. And so, 
well, we'll 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 figure this out offline, and and we'll figure out a way mechanically to make it um, work for uh, the uh, for the process of admitting the exhibits as well. Okay. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll just say, Your Honor, that we have already produced images of all of our exhibits, and some of them had the stamp, and we've on, on the exhibits that we produced to the plaintiffs, so that they had notice of all of the exhibits. We have removed the stamp on our. I wasn't involved in the mechanics to tell you how complicated right. that was, but we have done that. But one question is, since the documents did come from Monsanto, I mean, maybe it would be easier mechanically from an IT standpoint for Monsanto to remove the stamps and, re and resubmit them to the plaintiffs. I don't know the answer to that. You know, I don't want to spend any more time on it, but I will order you all to spend, both sides, to spend some time figuring out mechanically what's the easiest way to do that. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Thank you.